in John's Gospel, the fourth book of the New Testament, chapter 20. I'd like for you to turn to that chapter, John chapter 20. And I'd like to read this morning from verse 19 through 31. In those verses, beginning with 19 through 31, we, we see in the early part what Jesus did on Easter Sunday, the day he rose from the dead. We learn a lot about who Jesus really is and what's most on his heart by what he did, where he went, who he met with on this highest day in the Christian calendar, the day he rose from the dead. What did he do? We'll learn something about what matters to him from these verses. John 20, 19. So when it was evening... On that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Let me just comment quickly as we read through this. When he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, this is not yet the fullness of the Holy Spirit. They were to receive that 50 days later on the day of Pentecost. What he was granting them was the authority to proclaim the grounds upon which forgiveness is granted. Not the power to forgive sins ourselves. Because the language is very clear here, and depending on what version, you may have a footnote. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. It the, the Greek language is, if you proclaim someone's sins forgiven, you're doing that on the basis of their sins having been forgiven. In other words, we are always following the direction of the Holy Spirit in saying to someone, you've met God's conditions for forgiveness, repentance, and faith, and you are therefore, consider yourself forgiven. We say that on the authority of the Holy Spirit conveying that to us. We don't actually give forgiveness. I can't pronounce forgiveness to you or not. I wouldn't mind that sometimes, but I'll, I'll work on that with some of you. I don't have that kind of authority, and Jesus isn't giving that kind of authority but he is giving us the authority to proclaim the basis on which he forgives sins. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here with your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who do not see and yet believed. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing 
ye may have life in his name. Now, I want us to look at four issues that come out of this passage of Scripture. Back of these four issues is the deepest desire Jesus has, and that is that we might come to him in faith and have life. That's his desire. Everything he did here on this first Easter and a week later was aimed at getting us to believe him, to accept him for who he is and what he can do and put our trust and obedience in him. That's what he came for. That's really, you'll notice, what early on the disciples did because when they on the first Sunday, on Easter Sunday, recognized Jesus indeed was written, was risen. What did they do? They went and found Thomas, who was on spring break and didn't go to Easter. Okay? He wasn't at church. But what did they do? They went and told him, Jesus is risen. He wasn't there. They automatically wanted him too to believe and to find what they found. That's normal. If I have it in here, I cannot, the scripture says, that when, in the book of Acts, when the disciples were beaten with clubs because they wouldn't shut up, wouldn't stop preaching, they said, how can we not keep saying what we've seen and heard. If it's in here, I can't keep it from coming out here. And so they told Thomas, Jesus is risen. And they, they, I won't get off into this, but they might have thought themselves poor witnesses. They didn't get a conversion out of him. You know, they figured if we did a good job, he would have been convinced. No, because we're dealing with more than just this. We're dealing with this. Because Thomas didn't say, I'd love to, but I can't believe. He said, if I don't such and such and such, I will not. That's not an issue of that. That's an issue of that. But the first thing I want us to see is Jesus perceives, meaning he knows where we're at. He knows our hearts. First, he confronted the disciples. Went into the room, it says, where it was locked for fear of the Jews. He knows when I am fearful. I am troubled. I am frightened to death. I am facing issues I don't know what to do with. I feel helpless and hopeless. The truth of the matter is that isn't a, good, that isn't, uh, a bad spot to be in. It can be one of the best. Because then God presents himself and says, I'm here. I'm here. The second person that he confronts is Thomas. In this case, it's obstinate unbelief. I won't believe. I think part of the reason Thomas believed is because he saw, which Jesus kindly zinged him for. To see, lots of times people say, I've heard this all my life, Man, if I could have been in the Israelites and seen Mount Sinai on fire and bread falling from heaven and the Red Sea divided, and oh, I would have believed. Um, no, probably not. And Jesus chided him a little bit. I'm glad you're believing, but you're believing based on sight. So it's not that big of a deal. Don't dislocate your shoulder patting yourself in the back. Blessed, he said, are those who haven't seen but have tender enough hearts that they'll believe and they'll accept the Holy Spirit's work in their heart this is true Jesus knows my heart he knows the arguments I marshal he knows what I am saying to myself he knows the rationalization I'm going through to try to convince myself that I'm alright when I'm not he knows. There is, I love this, 
little phrase back in the, I think it's in Ecclesiastes. There is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. You can't out-argue God. You can't tie him in knots. There's, there, you might as well give up. He knows the innermost thoughts of my heart, and he knows how to address them. The second thing, Jesus presents to us. He performs, and the word perform is here several times in this passage, that Jesus did things so that they would believe. You ever heard of the phrase or the term naked faith? Just plain naked faith? If you haven't, that's okay because there's no such thing. You know that? God doesn't require us to believe on no basis at all. Listen, and I don't mean this to sound harsh. He has given us such a mountain of evidence within here, within the world, within our conscience, within his word, to convince us that if we will not believe on the basis of that, it means hell. There's no such thing then as, well, I'm just going to go out on a limb and believe God. It's the opposite. There's so much that I have to stiffen my neck and harden my heart and say, I won't believe. Won't do it. So Jesus presented verse 20 to the disciples. He said, he showed, see that word? He showed them his hands and his side. And he said, it's me. He's doing all he can to persuade us. God doesn't stand back and fold his arms and just say, you better believe or else. Why God pulls all the stops out, pleading with us, presenting us irrefutable evidence. I'm real. You know right from wrong, whether you say you do or not. And you have a pretty good idea what he thinks of your heart, your behavior, your thoughts. We know. We know. He presents all the truth he can, pleading with us, painting our picture to us. I don't know. I've way lost track of the number of times people have said to me, it was like you lived in our house the previous week because of what you preached on Sunday. Do you know what? And people might, I don't know if they mean that as a compliment to me, but it, it, you're sending it the wrong direction. There's a God. I wasn't in your house, but there was somebody who was. I didn't hear you, but there was somebody who did. I didn't see you, but there was someone who did. And that someone is dogging your footsteps in the kindest way and in the right good way. There is no story stalker like the Holy Spirit. You'll never throw him off of your trail. You can cut through the creek and you can do all whatever you want to do. You'll never lose him. He knows. He follows you. And he taps you on the shoulder. I heard that and I didn't like it. You ever felt that? The third thing that Jesus does, <clears throat> he persuades, he pleads with us. In verse 27, he told Thomas, don't be unbelieving, but believing. Move. Act on the evidence you have. Seek me. Listen to me. Obey me. Jesus fills, he fills this world. He, you cannot get away from him. That great Psalm 139, David said, if I take the wings of the morning and fly to the uttermost islands on the earth, behold, you are there. There's no, no fleeing him. 
And he's there to talk to me, to call me, to plead with me, to reason with me, to tug at my heart. He alone knows how to mingle together a sense of his displeasure and his wrath, but also a drawing, a, a something in here that encourages me there's hope with him. Even though I've displeased him and I'm separated from him, there's forgiveness with you, the scripture says, so that you may be feared, so that I can get along with you. This Jesus that we celebrate being risen from the dead today is out to persuade me and convince me. I had a conversation not too long ago also with someone who <clears throat> told me, I invited this person to church and um, talked to him a little bit just about where he was at spiritually. And this could be a, com a you know, composite of a thousand conversations I've had. People launch into this deal about how, well, you know, um, there's truth in every religion. And, you know, there's lots of ways to God. And Christians should not say that Jesus is the only way. Christians don't say that. Jesus did. I'm not saying it. I'm merely repeating what he said. He said, if I'm the door to the sheepfold, you climb up any other way, you're a thief and a robber, and you can't get in. And he said, if you do not believe that I am the one, you'll die in your sins. The founder of Christianity said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He said that. I didn't. But I have to believe it if I'm going to be a follower. Because that's what he said. Jesus persuades me that he is the way. And there is no way. There is, according to Peter, no other name on the face of the earth. No other name under heaven by which we're saved. I cannot be saved but through Jesus Christ. Finally, he preserves, he keeps me, he gives me life. He preserves me from the wrath to come. Finally, he preserves me, ultimately saves me from hell. That's why Jesus came, to save me from what the Bible calls the second death. What is the second death? Second death is simply this. The separation, and I'm not being hard on you at all. The separation that I know some of us here this morning feel. If we're honest, I do not have that warm fire in my heart, the presence of the Lord Jesus walking with me and talking with him fellowshipping with him it's cold and the ashes are just lying there gray in the fireplace and there's no light and there's no warmth and I know it it is that separation with God made permanent that's all hell is hell is the separation that I experience now between me and God because of sin made permanent. In other words, I have stiffened my neck long enough that I finally died and physical death overtook me while I was still in that status of being separated from God and that separation was made eternal. That's what's called the second death. Now, What's so far, far, far worse about that than just the separation we have here is that now, even though I'm separated from God and I don't have assurance of salvation, I still have the Holy Spirit's voice and Christians around me 
and light from the word of God and creation itself in this world, doing all, doing its best to persuade me, to talk to me, to call me, to awaken me. In hell, that's over. It's just darkness. Jesus came, verse 30 and 31, that we might have life through his name. In 30, many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. These have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, by believing, you may have life in his name. And what kind of life is he talking about? Well, your health. Nah, I like health. I'm all for it. But I, I saw someone the other day saying something about the greatest thing in life is when you have your health. Not this. It doesn't matter how healthy I am. One day this is going to fall into the grave. It's life in here. Eternal life that goes beyond this life. By believing, I have life. Let me just say this. There's a lot in this 31st verse. These things have been written. First of all, we can say this. God isn't going to give you any more evidence than's in, than in here. Okay? Don't be looking for something else. Well, I want more. You're not going to get more. He wrote enough. He gave us enough evidence. He said, okay, this is written, and that's all that's going to be written. That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. What does that mean? The Christ. The word here is really... The anointed one, the chosen one. What does that mean? This little illustration has always helped me. I, I hope it helps you. you. I may have given it before. But not too long ago I watched where the Queen of England was opening Parliament, and they do this every year. And she comes in, and she's seated on the throne, <clears throat> and there's a large bejeweled, stick in her hand. It's a scepter, it's called. It's an ancient, ancient, ancient symbol. It goes back thousands of years in all kinds of monarchies. It's, in a sense, the word just means a stick. But it has vastly more meaning than that. It is symbolizes the authority of that monarch. And especially, well, even to this day, you could probably say, if you come, if you approach the monarch or the president or whoever with no invitation and with no authority, at the best, you're going to get roughed up and arrested. The worst, if you're not, if you're in a true kingdom in parts of the world where they don't mind killing people, you're dead, with one exception. If the monarch extends that scepter to you, holds it out, that is saying, I'm offering you the ability to approach me and to bring your cause to me. I am accepting you. But what do you do? Well, you just sort of amble up with your hands in your pockets, popping gum and saying, how you, how you doing? No. You bow down. You get on your knees. You bow your head. And you touch the end of that scepter that the monarch's holding to the other end. That completes the acceptance. Then you rise to your feet and you converse with the king. Do you know that the Bible calls Jesus the Father's scepter? Jesus is the scepter. I don't just go to the Father unless it's through Jesus. That's what partly what Jesus meant. 
No one comes to the Father except by me. And so here's what the Father has done to an entirely rebellious race. We're separated. We're worthy of death. We have risen up in rebellion against the king. And we're under its treasonous, its mutiny. And we deserve death. Jesus, not with us approaching him first, but the Father extending Jesus to us invites us to come through him. And so the great Father extends the scepter to you and to me. Jesus. It's Jesus. And what do I do? I come to him. I kneel. I forsake. Like we become citizens, I renounce all allegiance to any other power. And I kneel. And I touch by faith the end of that scepter. Jesus, and a transaction is made. I am accepted with the Father. Does that make sense? Now try and approach the Father without touching the scepter. You understand what I'm saying? Well, I'm a good person. I shovel the widow's house next door to the snow all the time. I take care of her sidewalks and everything. You understand? I'll come another way. No, we won't. No, we won't. And the truth of the matter is, what it cost the Father to extend Jesus to us, it is not a minor thing if we then try to bypass that present our own worth to be coming before the king without kneeling and touching the scepter. That's not a minor sin. That is horrible to have God say, you're the rebel you're the one that caused the problem. But I'm taking the initiative and I'm standing, extending to you my offer of reconciliation. And this is how you do it. I extend Jesus to you. No thanks, I think I'll try it another way. You don't have to cook meth in the garage and sell it on the playground. You understand? We think that. Well, I tell you, well, he's a really bad sinner. Anybody that looks the dear face of Jesus squarely and says, I don't think so. I don't need that. Or maybe, maybe later. The truth of the matter is, that's a black heart. That's a black heart. I've got to come through Jesus and there's no other way. But if I do, and the words here too are all present tense, I keep believing. Not had some event back here, which I'm grateful for, where I did trust, I did repent, I did kneel. But if I've resumed my way and set God's law aside, and I'm walking that pathway no more. It is a myth that I'm still enjoying eternal life. It's a complete myth. This is all present tense. I am believing. By believing, I have life. I am having life. Easter then really is meaningless unless that's real to us and we recognize the price he paid the offer he's made and enjoy 
the assurance of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you know Jesus? Do you have him in your heart today? Are you assured? If you had to face God today, could you do it with a clear heart? His shining face, his countenance, the, the old blessing that the priests gave to the people of Israel. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Is that real to you today? If it isn't, by faith, not physically, by faith. This morning, seated here in my heart, I can reach and touch that scepter and say, I believe. I believe. While the musicians take their places, we will close with a song, and while we're singing, we'll stand in a moment to sing together. While we are singing, I want you to sing, but if it'd be better that you talk to God in your heart and do some business with Him, do that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we close with some words set to music, I pray that you would help any heart here that knows I'm separated from God. Lord, help them just reach out and touch the scepter that the Father has extended to every human being always it is held out to us that if we will bow and touch the end of that scepter faith in Christ we have acceptance with you if we don't have that but we want it may we do it today in Christ's name will you stand